Bristol Bay region is famous for terrible weather. After landing at Twin Hills, I couldn't help but wonder how native Alaskans have long survived and even prospered in such an unforgiving climate. Peter Abraham, a respected Yupik elder from Togiak, was in Twin Hills, so I took a stroll with him to discuss just that. The prevailing wind we have in this area is uh, east, north, uh, north, southeast. That'll what uh, bend the grass, and that's your compass for the whole winter. Now, of course, you can't forget the influence of terrain. It's different. It's different wherever you have a channel. No, this have a channel right here. Yeah, the valley going down. The way. valley, yeah. That's your prevailing wind right there. Over there, it might be a little different. In a flat area, that is another different area too right sure, there. Sure, There's a lot of valleys across there. So the grass, the grass would be a little different from over here. Reading the wind is only one aspect. Villagers also monitor the clouds, and closely. But now what's out there? Now we're looking out there. And... Well, see, you know, you can, tell, you can see right there, see those clouds out there? And there's some inner clouds, you know, on top of the islands. Yep. Well, there's the wind out there right now. I had checked my PC earlier and knew he was on the right track. Pete and I agreed that we were in for some serious weather, and soon. When we're out there in the open water, see the hunting? Well, there's one certain mountain out there that you know, the cloud will build up on top of it sure. because it's rolling right there. Yeah. Well, when, it's built, when it builds up right there, well, you better get out of better there. Better get out of there, out yeah. Of there. That evening, I heard the wind begin to whistle and the characteristic rattle of ice and snow hitting the window. It was peat storm, one foretold not by modern weather technology, but by understanding and heeding nature's signs. Remarkable story of survival tonight. Two teenage girls from the Arctic village of Selawik were lost for nearly a week in the wilderness with no food or water. To make matters worse, the two struggled through blizzard conditions. Tonight, in their first television interview, these two survivors tell 11 News' Heather Johnson how they found their way back home. The Arctic tundra, a wide expanse of frozen beauty that can quickly turn deadly. For Martha Foster and Louise Clark, a simple afternoon snow machining trip became a journey that would change them forever. The two had left their home of Selawik for the nearby village of Norvik when the weather took a turn for the worse. And we had no clue where we were. It was real stormy out, but we, we never stop. We keep keep on going. The girls got completely turned around and ended up in the mountains, which on a clear day would have been within sight of home. That's when I just started crying on my snow machine, but I couldn't stop. That's when I was praying to at least make us a place shelter where we can sleep good because I know they wouldn't find us that night. When the girls had not returned the next day, family members became concerned. We began to uh, make up our mind, look, they didn't make it to Norwich. Salawik citizens launched a search and rescue operation, one that with help from neighboring villages grew to 150 people strong. Each morning searchers set out from the village across these flatlands trying to pick up the girls trail. They knew they must be missing somewhere in those mountains, but each night brought them back with the same result, nothing. As the days went on with no sign of rescue, the girls struggled to stay alive. We're Hungry then, thirsty. By then we were eating snow, chunks of snow. Our shelter started getting worse because it was, we were tired. And when she sit too long, I was just grab her and you gotta keep walking. While the two worked to keep their hopes up, hopes in the village were growing dim. When you go uh, four, five, six days and you still haven't found any clue as to where they are, uh, you know, you start worrying a lot. Little did the searchers know, several planes had flown right over Martha and Louise, but unfortunately didn't see them. It was on the morning of the seventh day that they were saved. I just go, Aku, snow going to where? And I climbed that hill, I couldn't move. And she 
okay, and she started running up the hill, and I don't stop, keep going, and I start really crying because I knew they were going to find us. Suffering from hypothermia, but amazingly uninjured otherwise, the two were taken to a hospital in Kotzebue. I don't, I don't remember what I said. It was just, <laughs> it was unbelievable that they spent that time in the kind of climate that we were having and still be able to walk like you see them walk. <laughs> <laughs> Martha actually is having a little trouble walking, but is expected to recover. Everyone in the village seems to agree their survival is a miracle. Because we walk Next straight down right. from it and we go this way. Did you think that you might not ever see your home again? Well, after we thought that way, but when we should pray, then we knew that God would lead us home. Selwick, Heather Johnson, Alaska's 11 News. Martha and Louise say in addition to drawing strength from their faith, they would not have made it without using the lessons they learned from village elders. Tomorrow on Alaska's 11 News at 10, we'll show you how Selwick leaders are making sure the old ways are not forgotten. Israel's Prime Minister... Well, millions of years ago, Alaska was a very different place, filled with animals and trees that were downright tropical. Now, of course, we can't see those things alive today, but we do have some records of them in the form of fossils. And there is a place in Sutton called Coyote Lake where you can find them. So we recently went on a hunt. Well, we could go look down there for some more. Are these guys finding them over here? Oh, they yeah. probably are. It's hard not to find fossils at Coyote Lake, and it doesn't hurt when you travel with a team of experts. And there's a beautiful bee. Are you guys having fun? Yeah. What about this one? The fossils you'll find here are about 55 million years old. They come from the time period called the Paleocene era. Beautiful, beautiful leaf. It's almost complete. There's another one right on top of it, but see how pretty that is? It's just like a geranium leaf with veins going out like this. Geologist Ann Posh says the peaceful lake surrounded by crumbling cliffs looked very different millions of years ago. Picture a collection of meandering streams washing debris down from the Talkeetna Mountains, a tropical climate with dense forests of huge hardwoods, pines, and palms. So it would be comparable to what you'd find in the cypress swamps of Georgia or northern Florida today. She says that habitat surely supported other life, but as yet, there has been almost no evidence. Obviously, there were animals uh, utilizing this forest. All this vegetation means that somebody had to be exploiting it. And we have looked and looked and looked. That is the great mystery why there are no vertebrates here. But evidence of the ancient plant world abounds, and you can see it in the soft sandstone and shale. These give us clues of a different ecosystem and, and how Alaska changes through time and uh, lets us know that uh, we live in a pretty fascinating area. Down below, children pick through the piles of rubble, where geologist Kirk Johnson says a bit of patience can yield some great results. Just sit down by a scree pile and uh, take your time and you'll get a, basically a feel for what you see. You'll start to see patterns in the rock and your odds of finding a fossil will go up quite a bit. Here's a pattern on a larger rock. Look carefully and you'll see tiny delicate leaves from a coniferous tree. But sometimes you have to look deeper and that's when a tool like a rock hammer can help. You look for a rock like this has a crack in it and you take your hammer and you loosen it up a little bit along that crack and then you open it up and you look for fossils in there. Knowing what you're looking at can sometimes make a huge difference. It's pretty tough to see this piece of petrified wood that after 50 million years is beginning to turn into coal. You can see the coal coming off. That's probably the remains of the bark. And this is the impression of the branch. Here's some bark right here. Much easier to spot is this petrified tree trunk. It stands nearly six feet tall and it's unusual because it is still standing straight up. But big or little, fossils here abound, and kids of all ages love to collect them. It's clear that a little patience can pay off pretty big. It's not hard to come out with a good haul, but the experts ask that you be thoughtful about what you actually take away. Leave a little bit for everybody else to, to come in and enjoy. 
because Coyote Lake is a place with an ancient story that's much too valuable for future generations of Alaskans to miss. Now it is a really neat place. If you'd like to learn more about the area, the Alaska Museum of Natural History has planned an outing there on Saturday, June 17th. It's free. Folks plan to meet at the museum. They're located in Eagle River at 10 o'clock and then caravan out to the site. And you can call the museum for more information. Dave and Mary, that is tonight's look inside Alaska.